Okay, welcome back. Uh, this chapter, uh, we will go over cells and tissues. And the average human body will consist of approximately 75 trillion cells. And of course, that will vary greatly on the person's age and their overall health and their size. But roughly 75 trillion cells. And there are some similarities between all these uh, cell types that we have. You know, the structures that are there and what those no particular structures do, but cells can vary greatly in their function and their size and their shape. So when we talk about a cell for this chapter, we'll talk about a very generic uh, composite cell with very common typical features. All right, we'll start talking about uh, some of the structures of the cell, and then we'll get into uh, various forms of the tissues. Uh, the first part, uh, the cell membrane. This is also called the plasma membrane. Either term is uh, acceptable, they are both interchangeable. This forms the outermost uh, border or barrier of the cell. It's what will help cells talk to each other and it also helps control what goes in and out of the cell. And the structure of this uh, cell membrane is what's called a phospholipid bilayer. And hopefully you'll remember uh, the term lipid that we talked about from chapter 2. It's the same uh, structure of a lipid but with something added to it. And I'll show you how that looks here in a second. Now the phospholipid bilayer is really a double layer of lipids and attached to those lipids is a, a phosphate group. And each of those uh, bila or bilayers has a distinct region to it. Remember the lipid has the glycerol head and then the fatty acid tails. Well those heads are classified as being hydrophilic. They love water. They enjoy being near water. And those fatty acid tails are called hydrophobic. They don't like water. They fear water. So that's why you have a bilayer. You have the tails facing each other and the heads facing away from each other. And these regions are what help control what material will enter and leave the cell. All right. uh, this is one example of a lipid with a glycerol head here and the fatty acid tails here. And on top of that, you have a phosphate group. So this is one phospholipid here. And what you have with a phospholipid bilayer, you have this is one layer, and here is a second layer. So you have the hydrophilic heads that enjoy water are facing uh, outside of the cell, where there's going to be liquid water, and inside the cell, where there's going to be water. And the tails uh, that are hydrophilic and don't, or excuse me, hydrophobic that don't like water will face each other. So that's why this is called a phospholipid bilayer, because bi means two. There are two layers. And the whole cell membrane is this structure all the way around uh, the cell, kind of like a, a fence around a property. I right, will talk about some other uh, areas, other organelles of a typical cell. Uh, the cytoplasm. Uh, within the cytoplasm, you'll find a, a structure that helps give the cell its, uh, its shape. It's called a cytoskeleton. Actually, it's like your, your skeleton gives your body its shape. It's the same principle here. The cytoskeleton gives the, skele the cell its generic shape. And the cytoplasm is the uh, jelly-like substance that all the uh, small organs sit inside. Kind of like a, I think of a jello mold with a fruit, a piece of fruit suspended inside it. The jello would be the uh, cytoplasm, and the fruit that's suspended within that are the uh, organelles. And these organelles are structures that have a very specific function. And this word actually translates to a small organ. You know, like your brain is an organ, your heart is an organ. So cells have their own organ-like structures called organelles. And they only have uh, very specific jobs that other organelles don't have. And those are the ones that we'll go over here next. All right, this image, even though it looks like an illustration, it is a real uh, scanning electron image taken of a cell. These red things look kind of like fibers or like hairs. Are they cytoskeleton? It will help give a cell its kind of oval or roundish shape. And this uh, bluish dyed uh, object is the nucleus or the center, the control center of the cell. To give you an idea of how this would look. Right, some other organelles 
uh, the first one here, uh, ribosomes. These are, are responsible for the synthesis of proteins. These are how proteins are made with the help of ribosomes. The next one, uh, the ER, uh, the full name is the endoplasmic reticulum. Perfectly fine just to call it ER for short. This is a series of uh, flattened uh, sacs that help move material around the cell. And there are two types of ER. It can be either smooth or rough. Uh, the smooth ER, or SER, is what is responsible for making uh, lipids. And then the rough ER, or the RER, are sections of the ER that are covered with ribosomes and are called smooth and rough because the rough ER looks rough. It looks like you took a, the smooth ER and sprinkled salt or pepper on it and it looks physically rougher than the smooth side does. And I'll show you how that looks. Right down here is a illustration but up here is a real slide of how this would look. Over here the smooth ER and this looks much smoother and much cleaner than the rough ER side does. And these little black dots here are ribosomes. So that's what makes the rough ER different from the smooth ER. There are ribosomes on the rough ER and none on the smooth ER. So smooth ER, lipid synthesis, the rough ER is where you'll find ribosomes. Alright, some other organelles, uh, vesicles. These are uh, small membrane-bound sacs that help transport material in and out and around the cell. Materials can't just enter a cell by themselves or move throughout the cell by themselves. They need to be wrapped in something. That's a vesicle. Uh, next one, uh, the Golgi apparatus, or sometimes called the Golgi body. Either term is fine. This is what will help package and finalize and deliver proteins that are made on the rough ER to various parts of the cell that need them. And probably one of the more important uh, organelles of the cell, the mitochondria. And the phrase that's always used by every science teacher when they talk about this topic is called the powerhouse of the cell. This is where uh, cells create energy. And from the food that you eat, like it's broken down through digestion, it gets chemically broken down into a compound called uh, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And it's in bold for a reason. You need to know what that compound is. This is the compound that gives your cells energy. Without ATP, your cells couldn't function. And if cells don't function, then they start to die. If cells die, tissues die. Then organs die, and then you die. So ATP is critically important. All right. Here's an illustration of what a mitochondria looks like, and here's a real image of one. And we won't get into the details of how it makes ATP or what these little uh, indentations are. That's how it actually looks. Uh, so a few more. Uh, lysosomes. Uh, the prefix lyse here means to break open. So a lysosome will break open and destroy uh, basically garbage that the cell wants to get rid of. So anything that's uh, damaged or the cell just doesn't want, it will go there as a uh, like a stomach to digest it and break it down. Uh, peroxisomes. This will help break down uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is a, a common byproduct of chemical reactions in the body. But hydrogen peroxide can be very dangerous and very toxic to cells. So cells need to get rid of that as soon as it can. So peroxisomes break down the hydrogen peroxide so it doesn't hurt the cell. And the last one on here is centrosome. These will create uh, spindle fibers which are very important in the role of cell division. And we'll talk about cell division here in a second. And the last two, these are always mentioned together because they have a similar function but they are very different. Uh, cilia and flagella, they're similar because they're both used for motion. But there are some big differences. Cilia are very, very short in length, and flagella are very long in length. And whenever you see cilia, you'll see them in very large numbers, you know, by the thousands, or tens of thousands. And when you see flagella, you'll only see one at a time, usually. So this is how cilia look. These look like tiny hairs, almost. And this slide was taken from uh, the esophagus. And if any of you 
are smokers and the reason why you have that annoying smoker's cough that nicotine and tar in the cigarettes will actually paralyze these hairs these cilia so you have to work harder to cough up that gunk from your lungs so you can swallow it and destroy it so the more that you smoke and the longer that you smoke the more these become uh, paralyzed and damaged so that's why you have to cough harder and harder to get that gunk out so this is just one location where you'll find cilia but a very short and lots of them all in a row compare that to flagella and the only cell in humans that you'll find in flagella are in sperm cells in males so very long here that's one and only one in number so there's one two three, four, five or six sperm cells here so very long and few in number very short and very high in number see last of the organelles here uh, the cell nucleus a uh, very large very circular uh, structure that helps control the cell this is the brain of the cell it's also where you'll find uh, the DNA of each cell within the nucleus okay the nucleus is so important that it actually has its own phospholipid bilayer that wraps around uh, the inside of the nucleus and it's called the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope either term is acceptable I'll have it listed as the nuclear envelope and within that nucleus is a very dense region called the nucleolus this is where ribosomes are actually made okay. and there's a you know, generic image of a, a typical cell in our bodies of course they will vary greatly on what part of their body they're found in what their function is they will vary greatly in size but when we talk about a generic you know, composite cell with all the organelles we talked about this is a good representation of it kind of just cut in half and all the cilia that are really, really small on the outside plasma membranes is cut open so you can see inside the nucle or nucleus here and a dense region inside nucleolus and the, the ER here and it's rough because you see the little black spots look like pepper have been you know, sprinkled on it those are the ribosomes mitochondria here and here so, so when it comes to these organelles we talked about uh, for this chapter you need to be able to match the function to the correct organelle because that will come up on the chapter test all right next we'll talk about uh, transporting materials uh, in order for a cell to function it must be able to get the material it needs inside the cell and get rid of the waste that it doesn't need otherwise the cell could not function so a cell membrane is classified as being semi permeable or sometimes it's called uh, selectively permeable and all this means is some things can pass through it and some things can't so that's why it's semi permeable now some materials can get into and out of the cell without using any energy at all but some things do need energy to get in and out so the, that covers two different types of transport so we'll talk about the ones that don't need energy first for that that's called uh, passive transport so the movement of molecules across the cell membrane without using energy and the way this works is particles are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration this is called going down a concentration gradient so going from high to low think of you know, rolling a ball down a hill it takes no energy to do that it just happens going area from high concentration to area of low concentration and there are three types of passive transport uh, diffusion facilitated diffusion and osmosis so all three of these are classified as passive because they don't require energy to happen all right first one diffusion that's the tendency of molecules to spread in an available space and the key thing here is that the particles move randomly until there's an uh, equal concentration throughout that space or an equilibrium and some factors that will you know, influence diffusion are temperature and distance and concentration and a good example of a way to think about this one that's not you know, listed on the next few slides if you were to stand in a room and spray something uh, very good or very bad smelling say in the classroom the people sitting in the front row of that class would smell it first and the people in the back of the classroom would smell it last because it's going to take time for that uh, the particles of that scent to diffuse or spread out evenly throughout the rest of the room 
So if I were to stand in front of a classroom and spray something that smells very, you know, very good, it's very concentrated in that front row where I first sprayed it. It's going to take time for that to spread out. An example I'll use here, if you add, uh, say, a lump of sugar to, say, lemonade or to sweet tea, if you were to drop that into a beaker or a glass of you know, that drink and let it sit there, over time it will eventually equally disperse throughout that container. Because the movement is totally random until it's at an equal concentration or an equilibrium. But the key for diffusion is the movement is random. Next one is similar to uh, regular diffusion, but it's, there's one real big difference. This is called facilitated diffusion. Uh, not all particles or compounds can pass through easily through some membrane. Either they're too big or they have a charge or they're just not soluble to get through some membrane. So these uh, particles, these compounds, need to help to get in the cell and need help to get out of the cell. And this is done by uh, proteins that are stuck within the cell membrane and act as a uh, as a tunnel or a hallway so these compounds can pass through that hallway to get in and out of the cell. So this process is called facilitated diffusion. It's diffusion like we just talked about but with the help of membrane bound proteins. You know, to facilitate something means to help something. So this is diffusion that has helped with proteins. And here's how that would look. Now these particles here, here, are too big to squeeze through this cell membrane here. So they need help to get in and need help to get back out. So this channel protein is a protein that's basically integrated or stuck inside a cell membrane. It acts as a, as a pathway for these large compounds to pass through the in and get out. So diffusion with the help of a protein. So that's facilitated diffusion. And the same thing here. It's a different shape of a protein, but the same process. These are still too big to get through the cell membrane. They need help to get in. They need help to get out. All because of a protein here and here. And the last type of passive transport we'll talk about, osmosis. This is the movement of water across the semi-permeable membrane. So the key things uh, for each of these three that we've talked about, for regular diffusion, the movement is random. For facilitated diffusion, it's, uh, it's facilitated with the help of proteins. In osmosis, you're moving, uh, it's the movement of water across the cell membrane. Now, when, you, when you're comparing the solutions on either side of that uh, cell membrane, you're comparing the concentrations of the, of the solutes, the stuff, inside and outside of the cell. That's, that's what will determine where water will move to. All right, those first three don't require energy to happen because they're going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The next ones we'll talk about are the exact opposite. These are called active transport because you're going against the concentration gradient. You went from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. You're going uphill. You're going against the grain. That's why you need energy to go against that grain as opposed to going downhill. This process also will depend greatly on proteins in the membrane to help you know, move it along. All right, first form we'll talk about is called endocytosis. Uh, endo is a reference to inside, so this is taking material inside a cell. And of course, all materials will be carried inside the cell uh, through a vesicle. And there are three forms of endocytosis, and they vary on what kind of material is being brought into the cell. So you have pinocytosis, phagocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. And it's how those three are different. Pinocytosis, the taking in of water droplets into the cell. Uh, phagocytosis, the taking in of a solid material, like a virus or a bacteria. And the last one, receptor mediated, uh, you're taking in a very specific type of particle. And only those particles that are you know, specific for that receptor are going to be affected. Nothing else will be. So all three of these are taking material inside a cell. All these require energy to happen. But they're different because they are going to uh, affect different items. Pinocytosis is water, 
phagocytosis, solid material, and receptor mediated, uh, you're targeting very specialized uh, receptors. Okay, here's how this would work. Uh, we'll start with a pinot here first. This will form a vesicle around the water droplets and take it in. Uh, you figure that to be a, uh, a virus or a bacterium. It will form a, a vesicle around the bacterium and take it inside the cell. And for here, you know, these receptors have these little crescents here that match up with these yellow stars. That's the only one that will get affected. So taking in that material. All three of these are taking material from outside the cell, taking it inside the cell, endocytosis. All three of these take energy. So now we have material taken inside the cell, so now we need to get material outside the cell. So the opposite of what we just talked about is exocytosis. Think of exo for exit. So you're getting material uh, out of the cell like waste and debris and stuff that the cell doesn't need. And the vesicles will wrap around the material that the cell is going to get rid of. That vesicle will bind to the cell membrane and the material is basically pushed out. And so as an example of that, that's the junk that the cell doesn't want. It's surrounded by that vesicle here. This vesicle will bind to the cell membrane and when it does that, the contents inside it will be expelled outside of the cell. And of course, you're taking material out of the cell that takes energy, it's exocytosis. All right, next we'll talk about the cell cycle and what a cell will typically go through and the various stages of a, a cell's life. Almost all cells have a very predictable pattern of what they do. And they spend time doing their normal functions, whatever that tissue where that cell is. Then they will divide to form uh, identical cells. Then they will eventually die. You know, some cells will divide more rapidly, depending on what tissue it is. Some cells divide very slowly, depending on where it is. But almost all cells have a very predictable pattern of what they would do, or what they should do normally. And this continuous series is called the cell cycle. You know, the cell doing its normal thing, then making copies of itself, and eventually dying. So the life of a cell, the cell cycle. And the cell cycle has uh, very distinct parts. Uh, interphase, mitosis, cytokinesis. Uh, the first one, interphase, this is where a cell will spend most of its life. Over, I think, 90% of a cell's life is spent in interphase. This is when they are doing this their normal function. And they are getting ready to divide. So in this stage, you'll find you know, the cell replicating its DNA and replicating all the organelles to make another copy. And there's a generic uh, chart of a cell cycle. Now, all this, the first three are interphase here. And don't worry about what G1, S, and G2 are. All that's interphase. And I'll talk about uh, mitosis here in a second. All right, uh, mitosis. A lot of people misunderstand what this is. They think mitosis is cell division, and it's division of the nucleus, not of the cell itself, but just of the nucleus. And there are various stages within uh, mitosis. Yeah, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And you need to be able to recognize these stages by what's going on and by picture. All right, uh, prophase. Uh, the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope will break down and the chromosomes where you'll find the DNA become visible to the naked eye. Uh, metaphase, those chromosomes will line up in the middle of that nucleus. So M for metaphase, M for middle. Uh, anaphase is where the chromosomes will start to pull apart from each other. So A for anaphase, A for away. And the last part here is telophase. The nuclear membrane will return and the chromosomes become invisible once again. Okay, here's an illustration, and I'll show you real images here next. So, prophase, the nuclear envelope here will break down, and these chromosomes will condense so we can actually see them. Metaphase, the chromosomes line up in the middle of the nucleus. They look almost like stitches. So, M for metaphase, M for middle. 
Uh, anaphase, they start to pull apart or move away from each other. So A, anaphase, A for away. And then telophase, you, at this point, you almost have two uh, distinct nuclei. Not yet, but almost. The nuclear envelope will come back, and the chromosomes will become less dense, and you can't see them with the naked eye. So you're about to have two uh, what are called daughter cells. Here's how it actually looks. The cell in its normal stage here. Uh, prophase. Here you can see the border of the nuclear envelope here. But here it's broken down. And you see these threads, the, or chromosomes that look like threads. That would be prophase. Metaphase, they're lining up in the middle. Anaphase, they're moving apart from each other. And then telophase, the nuclear envelope is starting to return on both of them. And this is becoming less dense, so you can't see. But you're about to have two distinct and separate uh, nuclei. All right, after telophase, the rest of the cell will now go through cell division. So all the organelles, all the cytoplasm, at this point has already been doubled, but now half of it goes to one way, the other half goes the other way. And that process is called cytokinesis. So when, you, when you're done with all of the cytokinesis steps, you have two separate and identical cells. Think of this process as going through a copy machine. You start with one cell, you have mitosis, cytokinesis, now you have two. that uh, should be identical. Okay. Alright, next we'll move on to uh, various types of tissues that we have. Uh, we talked about you know, cells at this point, so we'll move on to getting more, more organized, more complex. We'll talk about uh, tissues. So any large group of cells that have a common function, like we talked about before, are called tissues. And all tissues in your body fall into one of four categories. Epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. So everything in your body will be one of these four. Now for this chapter, we'll talk more about epithelial tissue and connective tissue. Because when we talk about the muscular system, we'll talk about uh, muscle tissue then. And when we talk about the nervous system, we'll talk about nervous tissue then. So muscle and nervous will have their own separate chapters. So for the rest of this chapter, we'll talk about just epithelial and just connective. All right, we'll start with epithelial tissue. Uh, this is tissue that will cover organs and lines of the hollow organs, you know, like the spleen uh, and liver, and also will line body cavities that we talked about in uh, chapter one. They always have a surface that's exposed to an open space or the outside world. And the key thing here that's not found in any of the other three types of tissue, uh, these cells are anchored down to what's called a basement membrane. This term is only associated with epithelial tissue, not with the other three. So this usually gets asked on the test somehow, but basement membrane only goes with epithelial tissue. All right, the major functions of all epithelial tissue, uh, filtration, uh, secretion, absorption. Another key trait about epithelial tissue, they do not have blood vessels. It's called avascular. They are without vessels. A means lacking or without. So avascular without vessels. All right, epithelial tissue can be classified by the number of cells that are there and the shape of the cells that are there. So the first three that are listed here are referencing their shape, and the last two are in are referencing their number. Uh, so squamous cells, these are very flat, very thin cells, almost like a pancake. It's a good way to think about it. Uh, cuboidal are cells that are shaped like a cube. That's why it's cuboidal. Or they could be uh, columnar. These are column shaped. Think of a column on a building, like a courthouse or a library. So these three are going to be referencing the shape of that cell in epithelial tissue. And next two are a reference to how many cells are there. Uh, simple only refers to one layer only. So you can have simple squamous. You can have simple cuboidal. You can have simple columnar. And then if there's two or more layers, then it's called stratified. You know, a stratus or a stratum is another word for a layer. So stratified is multiple layers of 
whatever tissue. You can have stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, stratified columnar. Right, give you some information about uh, some examples of these uh, types of tissue and where they may be found and give you an image of what it would look like if you ever see it on the slide. Uh, the simplest one, simple squamous. No, simple, so it's one layer and squamous flattened cells. These are found at areas where you have uh, filtration or diffusion, like in the air sacs of the lungs, uh, blood vessels, and in capillaries. This is a, a real slide of how it would look. You know, one layer of cells here, and they're very flattened, so flat that the nuclei, which is plural for nucleus, have been kind of squished down. And it's epithelial tissue, so it's exposed to an open space up here. So one layer of flattened cells. Uh, simple cuboidal. Uh, simple because it's one layer, and cuboidal means cube-shaped. These are are usually pretty easy to spot because they have a very large nucleus, almost dead center of the cell. And you'll find this tissue in, uh, in a, inside the kidney tubules, uh, in the thyroid gland, and also uh, covering the ovaries. And they usually form this kind of kind of donut shape to them. So, like from here to here is one cell, and a very large nucleus here. And a simple cuboidal tends to line itself in a a ring shape like this. So that's one layer here, one layer here, one layer here. So all these individual cells, like that's the nucleus, that's the nucleus, nucleus, nucleus. So that looks nothing like that. One layer of flat cells, one layer of you know, cube-shaped cells. Uh, simple columnar. Uh, simple because it's one layer, and then column-shaped, or columnar. These may have cilia, they may not. It depends on where they're found. Some do, some don't. Uh, here you'll find the nucleus uh, at the bottom of the cell, almost always to, at the bottom toward the basement membrane. And some areas you'll find these, uh, the intestines, uh, the stomach, and inside the uh, lining of the uterus. So these dark circles here are the nuclei. They tend to line up almost in a straight line. And the basement membrane would be here. So that's one column-shaped cell here, one column-shaped cell here. And all that is one layer there. There's one layer here, one layer over here. One layer, column-shaped cells, given away by its obvious shape, because this looks nothing like that, which looks nothing like that. All based on their shape of their cells. And the only stratified one we'll talk about is stratified squamous, because it's much more common than stratified cuboidal or stratified columnar. We do have those, but they're nowhere near as, as prevalent as stratified squamous. Uh, stratified means many layers, squamous flattened cells. Uh, the cells start off uh, round, but then they get flatter and flatter and flatter the closer you get to the surface because they're becoming more and more dead. Uh, good uh, spots where you find these, the outer layer of the skin, uh, the linings of the mouth and the vagina and the anal, ca uh, anal canal. So all this here, the dark, darker purple, is squamous cells. They start off kind of round, then they get more and more squished and more and more dead by the time we get to the top. So all this are squamous cells, but they're multiple layers, so stratified squamous. And this is what your skin would look like. That would be the epidermis layer, the top layer, and below it would be the dermis. So this gives you a lot more protection, which is what you would expect from you know, these locations. The outer layer of the skin, uh, mouth, vagina, anal canal, you want those to have a high degree of protection. All right, uh, next we'll move on to connective tissues. These are the largest type of tissue in the body by weight. This includes uh, blood, cartilage, and bone. So we talk about just the overall mass, the overall weight of the tissues that you have. Connective tissue is by far the largest because you're including bone, which is very, very rigid. Uh, some functions uh, offer protection and support and binding tissues to other tissues. 
Uh, these would be different from epithelial tissue because the cells are much further apart from each other and that space in between those cells are filled with various types of fibers. It depends on what kind of connective tissue you're talking about. Uh, one we'll talk about uh, here as a preview for another chapter, bone. Uh, like I mentioned a second ago, the most rigid type of connective tissue. This will offer protection and framework for the body. And obvious locations are the skeleton and in the middle ear. And this is uh, how a compact bone would look if you cut it cross section. And when we get to that chapter on the skeletal system, we'll talk about why it looks the way it does here and what these dark markings are. There's a reason why those are there. They have a special name. But that's one unit here. That's one unit here. And that's one unit here. We'll talk about what these are called in a few chapters. That's how bone would look in a cross section. All right, that brings us to the end of chapter three. Uh, like I mentioned before, we'll talk about uh, muscle tissue uh, on its own chapter and nervous tissue in its own chapter later on in the course. So if you have questions, please feel free to contact me.